Well, good morning, good morning, everyone. Glad to see all these beautiful faces. I will say that um, I was a little concerned because it's spring forward, right? I'm like, oh, man, it's going to be late coming in this morning. So glad to see all you guys this morning. As um, Pastor Will stated, my name is Patrick Flowers, and I serve here at the Church of Martinsburg, by God's grace, leading the membership ministry. I am one of five other elders here at the, here at the church. Our lead pastor, Pastor AJ, and his wife, Sheree, are on vacation, spending some time to get away and relax and recoup and recover and, you know, just spend some quality time with one another. So if you guys were coming to see him, I apologize, guys. You're going to hear from me this morning. I hope you're not too disappointed. <laughs> All right. All right. If you've ever spent any time here at the Church of Martinsburg, you may recall that we have been working through a series called, the, called Crucial Questions. The intent of Crucial Questions series is to answer some of those questions and or concerns that arise from both believer and non-believer alike. This is by no means an exhaustive inquiry of all the questions that pertain to the Christian faith, but it's, it's an aim to really answer those questions that kind of catch Christians flat-footed when they're asked by non-believers. So that's what the intent here is as it relates to this series. By God's grace, I'm going to answer the question, how much should we forgive? How much should we forgive? Before we dive in, I want to talk to you first about June 19th, 2015. June 10th, 2015. A woman by the name of Nadine Collier at the time, a 47-year-old black woman, looked squarely into the eyes of a 21-year-old white male, white man, and uttered these three words into the atmosphere of American history that still resonate with me today. I forgive you. She continued with these words after she spoke those three words. You took something very precious away from me. I will never get to, get to talk to her again. I will never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. You've hurt me. You hurt a lot of people. If God forgives you, I forgive you. This 21-year-old white man that Miss Collier was speaking to that day was Dylan Roof. And it was just two days after he walked into Emmanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, joined a small group of uh, believers for a weekly, weekday Bible study, and at the conclusion of that Bible study, he commenced to pull out arms and began to fire off shots, injuring and killing many, nine in total. Of the nine that he shot, and killed one of those dear people, one of those dear believers was Miss Collier's mother. The world observed that day, two days after that horrific event, they observed with amazement a woman's astonishing demonstration of grace. I forgive you. One writer from a very popular publication, he wrote this, he himself being an atheist, he tweeted that day after watching that video, after watching that sister share those three words. I'm a non-Christian, and I'm quoting him, by the way, and I must say this is a remarkable advertisement for Christianity. When Miss Collier was asked a year later about her words in, on that day in front of her murder and her, the murder of her mother and church family members, she said, forgiveness is power. It means you can fight anything and everything head on. I want to talk to you about that power this morning. I want to talk to you about the power of forgiveness. If you want to talk about a Christian ethic that separates it from any other worldview, any other dogma, any other philosophy, it is the idea of radical, unfathomable, unthinkable, unconscionable forgiveness. It separates Christianity from any other thought pattern or any other thought or any other worldview in human life and cultures around the world. It is something that is not easily grasped or even something that is easily understood. In fact, even the guys who walk with Jesus struggle to wrap their arms around the concept of forgiveness. So what we'll be reading this morning is one of those guys who walk with him, Peter in particular. With that said, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, if you have your Bibles. If you don't, there are some Bibles in the back of the church and or the sanctuary on the black tables. You're more than welcome to grab that as we read along. 
Again, this is Matthew 18, verses 15 through 35 is what we're going to be reading. But I will focus on verses 21 through 35. But we, we, need to, we need to start at verse 15 just to give us a bit more context, if you will. So, Will, this is the reason why I have all these Bibles up here. I brought my own, by the way. And this is what it says. Um, why don't you stand to your feet while we read God's Word, please, if when you have it. I see everybody standing to their feet. And this is what the Word of the Lord reads. It says, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Verse 21. Then Peter came up to him and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not have you had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Church, let's pray. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, we pray that you may come down today and commune with us. Please open up this word and give us eyes and ears to hear and to see, Lord, so that it may change and conform us more and more into your image. We love you. It's in Christ's name. Amen. You guys can be seated. In verse 21, Peter begins with a question. Then Peter came up to him and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? This parable begins with a very straightforward question. How often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Before we get too far into Jesus' answer, let's just stop for a moment, pause, and let's just sit on Peter's question for a minute. First, the most likely reason that Peter is asking Jesus this question is because of the events and the teaching and the words that Jesus just gave them a few moments uh, ago in verses 15 through 20 of this, of this chapter. In verses 15 through 20, Jesus lays out the details for a very serious process that is intended to help the church deal with unaddressed and unchecked sin against one another, a process that we have come to know as church discipline. In other words... When people get out of order and refuse to repent, then the church must take action. Beginning at verse 15, it states, If a brother sins against you, go tell him his faults. Go tell that sister her faults privately. And if they listen, praise be to God. You can move on. You've won your brother. However, if they refuse to repent, 
Then the second step is to bring a few, for, few more of the folks along. Those who, who have even borne witness to the transgression of the sin or those who can speak with some sort of wisdom as both of the cases are being made between the two parties. And if that group determines that, yes, this person is in sin, this brother or this sister is in sin, and they say, hey, you need to repent, and they still refuse to repent, then the next step is for this man to be brought before the entire church in, a, in order that the church may have the opportunity to plead with this brother, plead with this sister for repentance. However, if they refuse to repent, Jesus says we should treat them like a tax collector or a Gentile, meaning that we should treat them like someone who is now on, a, on the outside of our Christian fellowship. Because when we refuse to live by the authority and the principles given to us by Jesus, we put the unity of the entire church at risk. And we run the risk of inducing and introducing greater sin into the church. And we bring shame to the witness of the church, which we are called to represent here in the world. So that's what's being taught in verses 15 through 20. Those are all hard teachings, but those are teachings that Jesus has given us. I'm not reading you guys anything that's not in those um, texts. But here's an important distinction that we need to recognize. The refusal to repent is not normal. In the life of the church, there are many occasions when we are sinned against, and there are many occasions when we are the ones doing the sinning against another person. And in most of those occurrences, in most of those occasions, they end with confession and repentance. They end with, man, I'm sorry. Man, my bad. I didn't mean to do that. Please forgive me. Yes, we are certainly sinners, but many of us are sinners who understand that, that we have been redeemed by the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as a result, we are living with an eager desire to grow and to be more and more like him. We welcome and we desire the process of sanctification to take hold in our lives, which means that we're being renewed day by day more into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's what most of us in the church are here to do, right? So while there are occasions where there are people who are unrepentant, there are a ton of occasions where there are people who are actually repentant. And Peter seems to anticipate those people in his question in verse 21. Let's look back at it for a second. He says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. We talked about what we need to, need to do to the unrepentant people, but what about the repentant people? How often should we forgive them before we toss them out of the church? Peter says, seven times. You might think to yourself that he's kind of just tossing out numbers, right? But really the number seven is pretty significant. The first thing that we need to consider when we hear the word seven is the traditional rabbinic view towards forgiving someone who has sinned against you. You are only obligated to forgive someone up to three times. So traditional, traditional Jewish culture would have said, hey, they come to you, they ask you for forgiveness, you extend grace. They come again, asking for, for forgiveness, you extend grace. They come a third time, asking for forgiveness, you extend grace. But after that fourth time, you can cut them off. It's over. In fact... One historical quote that talks about this very thing, it says, if a man commits a transgression the first, the second, and third time, he's forgiven. The fourth time, he is not. So Peter's commitment to forgiveness would have been seen by many as generous. Peter's like, hey, I'm taking it up a notch, right? I'm doubling it. It's not just three. It's seven now. Double plus one. Right, Jesus? Isn't this great? I mean, in fact, I'm pretty sure in Peter's mind, he's probably representing Jesus well. He's representing him very well in his mind. Jesus is always taking it up a notch. So let me anticipate that, and I'm going to take it, up, take it up a notch for him. Another useful thing that we consider when we're talking about the idea of seven is that seven has significance in biblical literature. Tim Mackey, a biblical theologian and language scholar, says this about the use of seven in Scripture. He says this, and I'm quoting him. Seven was symbolic 
in ancient Middle Eastern and Israelite culture and literature. It communicated a sense of fullness and completeness. In fact, seven is spelled with the same consonants as the word complete and full in the Hebrew. So Peter's suggestion we have here not only would have been considered generous, by, generous but it also rises above all of the rabbis of his day. I bet Peter is thinking to himself, I have completed my requirement for forgiveness. I forgave them seven times. That's plenty. They don't get it right after that. Well, hey, I tried. Right, Jesus? Right? Am I right, Jesus? And Jesus is saying, no, Peter, that's not right. So how does Jesus respond? Let me stop before we get there, and let me just say this to you. Before we make light of what Peter is calling us to this morning, it's kind of easy just to kind of laugh Peter off, right, and kind of think to ourselves, oh, silly Peter, right? How can you think that Christians are only called to forgive people seven times, right? What a trickster, what a jokester Peter is, right? But how often have you actually had to forgive someone who committed and repented the same transgression against you seven times? How many of you had to do that five times? How many have you, have you have done that four times? I would venture to say that some of you have cut people off after two. So what Peter is recommending here, this is not just ABCs, one, two, threes. This is calculus that Peter is offering you. Some of you are probably struggling to offer that forgiveness after somebody did that slip one time. He just crossed the line too many times, Pastor. It is what it is. So don't just brush Peter off, his recommendation off too quickly, without just sitting here with the weight of actually having to forgive someone seven times for committing the same transgression against you. Now, with all of that in the backdrop, pay attention to how Jesus responds. Verse 22. Jesus says to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Jesus calls Peter and the other disciples and us to something so much higher than we can ever imagine. Now, Jesus is not giving Peter mathematics. It's not just seven times 11 here, guys. You know, he does not expect Peter to kind of walk around with a memo scroll, right, and just kind of notching off every time somebody transgresses him, every time his brother sins against him, he's just kind of notching it off. He says, hey, man, you're up to 76. One more time, I'm going to cut you off. That is not what Jesus has in mind here, guys. That is not what he has in mind. The point, Jesus' point is not to, ref, to reduce forgiveness to a counting contest. Rather, his point is to help us understand that for the Christian, forgiveness is a way of, the, a way of life. We just stop counting. And that's the big idea, guys, by the way. For the Christian, forgiveness is embedded in the very fabric of our being. It is the way of the Christian life. We must stop counting. So here's the answer to the question. How much should we forgive? I'm giving it to you already, guys. guys. Now, the world around us may be relentless in its commitment to dispose people when they cross these designated lines, or counsel someone that does not toe the line in agreement with us. But such is not the way of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, may it never be said of you as a people that you withhold forgiveness when it is being sought after. Now, Jesus knows that he's cutting against the grain here and calling the disciples and us to something that feels simply to be unreasonable. So that's why he gives us a parable to make what's cloudy clear for those who really want to see and those who really want to hear. So in verse 23, this is what Jesus says. He says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Jesus, from the very beginning, is rearranging our understanding of forgiveness by saying, Yes, the world may have its own ideas on how to handle sin against them, but such is not the kingdom. 
The story that I'm about to share with you, you disciples, explains how we handle sin in the kingdom against us. And the king in this story, who was over the kingdom? Of course, this is King Jesus. And the servants are us. Now, in the kingdom, our understanding of forgiveness always starts with the king. Your understanding of forgiveness always starts with the king and how we relate to the king. He calls us servants. But really, these are probably more likely high officials. They are, con they are considered serving under the king. They're not like runts in the kingdom, if you will. They're probably folks that have place and position, but they serve the king. So they serve him, and Jesus used the uh, character of service because we as a people are creating his image and likeness, and we are now servants of the king. We owe our allegiance to the king. We are called to serve him in every way possible. But as servants, as officials of the king, we also represent the king. But also, they owe the king. And that's the piece that unlocks all the discussion about forgiveness, our owing the king. Verse 24 says, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That brings me to my first point. This is the debt that stirs forgiveness. Let's think about this for a moment. One talent, one talent equals 6,000 denarii. That's one talent. One denarii equals one day of a typical labor's wage in ancient Israel, meaning that what the servant owes the king is equivalent to 60 million days of labor. Now, to put this in context, if you started working with the king, let's say at a wage, let's say the king was very generous, right? And he says, I'm going to pay you 10 times the typical day's wage for your labor. I'm going to pay you 10 times that. Let's say you decide to start working for the king at 10 times that wage for, let's say, 100 years with no days off. You collect every single dime of it. You know, you just pick up food wherever you can. You pick it up. You just collect all that money, and then at the end of that 100 years, if the king is still alive, which he probably isn't, you say, hey, king, here's that sum of money. I have worked, and I have labored. Here's that sum of money. You have earned 365,000 denarii, meaning even if that salary was possible and you worked to the bone for, 10, for 100 years, you will still have only paid back less than 1% of the debt that you owed him. The point that Jesus is making is, is that this man simply cannot pay this debt back ever. That's the point that he's making. It must be forgiven. Did you hear that, guys? It must be forgiven. You and I are servants of the king. We're called to serve the king. We're called to represent the king. But none of us have the capacity to pay the king back what we owe just through our service. We cannot pay the debt back. It must be forgiven. That is the debt of sin. Our sin against a holy and righteous God is too big to be paid off just by doing good things. It must be forgiven. There's not enough good you can do in this life to erase the debt that you owe. That's the debt that stirs forgiveness. But what about the penalty that stirs forgiveness? Verse 25, let's look at this. And since he could not pay his pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The Bible says, and since he could not pay, there's just no amount of good or time that he can do to work this debt off. There's nothing in him that can produce this repayment. So the only thing that is, that is right and just for a man that owes a man it's restitution. Since he could not pay the, the king back what he owes, the king threatens to punish, or he threatens to judge and punish. Saints, you and I have sinned against a holy God. When he says go right, we consistently and daily go left. We have mocked his ways. We have mocked his commandments. He called us to one thing, and we kind of chuckle and laugh and say, who would ever do something like that? 
on countless occasions, we have made idols out of creation. We have made idols out of money, sex, power, family, and material. And we replace God in our hearts, an eternal God in our hearts, with temporal idols. And as a result, the Bible says that our penalty for our sin against a holy and righteous God and an eternal God is a holy and righteous and eternal judgment. That's the penalty. Brothers and sisters, hell is the place where our judgment is exacted for the debt that we owe God. That's where the debt is provided sufficient payment. We owe an insurmountable debt, and we are due an insurmountable judgment. What should a servant do when faced with such an insurmountable debt that requires an insurmountable judgment? That servant should plead for mercy, which leads to my third point, the pardon that stirs forgiveness. Verse 26, so the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. He cried out. He cried out, have mercy on me. Have patience with me, and I will pay you back everything. Fam, have you ever made those prayers? Lord, have mercy on me. I would never, ever, 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 ever do it again. Everybody ever done that before? Oh, Lord, can you just help me out of this? And I will never do this again. I mean, he just can't. He's making a plea that he just cannot fulfill. I'll pay you back everything. He just can't, guys. He can't. But the Lord looks on him with pity. The king looks on the servant with pity, and he releases him, and he forgives the debt. You know, it would have been, it would have been a good king. It would have been a just king if he had just said, hey, you just work until you cannot work anymore, and we'll just call it even. That would have been a good, that would have been a just king. It would have been good for Jesus to say that, hey, you just work and continue, until you just cannot work anymore. Just keep grinding it out every single day. And in the end, we'll just call it even. But if you don't, if you take one day off, I'm cutting you off, and it's over. But the king doesn't do that, does he? He wipes the slate clean. The man promises to work as hard as he can. And, of course, we know that this man cannot work hard enough to ever pay this debt off. So the king says, no, the debt is erased. You don't have to work another day in your life to earn forgiveness for your debt. Your debt has been wiped clean. That's what Jesus has done for you. No longer do you have to find yourself trying to earn his affirmation, earn his approval. Through Christ, the Father has given you his approval. Through Christ, you've been crowned with righteousness. Through Christ, you have been given eternal life. And the days when you work well, you'll still have eternal life. In the days when you don't work so well, through Christ, you'll still have eternal life. You're not working to forgive that debt. It's already been paid. That's the goodness of Christ. You would think, guys, man, that is a great story. Until we get to verse 28. This is where the parable takes a horrible turn. Verse 28 says, But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. So this man leaves with a 60 million denarii debt forgiven. And then he sees one of, one of his workers and, and asks, who asked for the same types of forgiveness and mercy. Have patience with me and I will pay you back. Unlike this man, he can actually pay him back. It's a hundred denarii. It's not a small sum of money, guys, but he can actually make payment. He can actually work hard and over time, you know, he can just make this payment. 
But the forgiven servant refuses and went and put him into, in prison until he should pay the debt. Verse 31 says, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not have you had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Let's take a few minutes to unpack this. Point four, the scandal that stirs unforgiveness. This is a scandal, guys. The servant refuses to extend mercy from the reservoir of mercy that has been given to him. He's been showered with mercy. Now, notice that the king's called to forgive the fellow servant. When he goes to the forgiven servant and he speaks harshly about him not forgiving that fellow servant, notice that the king in no shape, form, and or fashion is concerned about whether or not the servant is going to make payment back and all that kind of stuff. He's not concerned about that. That's not where the king's focus is. What is the king's focus? What is his concern? The king's concern is, have you already forgotten that I forgave you a debt that you can never repay? How dare you hold another debt over someone else? You see, saints, when we lose our ability or our commitment to forgive, it's often because we have lost sight of our debt. When we lose sight of our debt, we often lose our capacity and ability to forgive. You having trouble forgiving your, uh, in your home? It's probably because you've lost sight of how much you've been forgiven. Having trouble forgiving that family member? It's probably because you've lost sight of how much you've been forgiven. Having trouble forgiving that coworker? It's probably because you've lost sight of how much you've been forgiven. Having for trouble forgiving that church member? Uh-oh. It's probably because you've lost sight of how much you've been forgiven. So one reason, one big reason, why the world cannot understand the depth, the depth of Christian forgiveness is because they cannot understand the debt that we all owe, the, depth, the debt that has been given, forgiven through Christ. So when you're trying to talk to your friends, right, who are not Christians, and they're like, man, I would forgive that person. Well, of course you wouldn't forgive that person because you don't understand the depth of the debt that I have been forgiven. That doesn't resonate with non-Christians. That doesn't make any sense to them. So if you don't understand that piece, then you're not going to be able to make sense of the call that we have all been given as Christians to forgive. See, when we take inventory of our lives, oftentimes, along with our worldly friends and colleagues, we take inventory of our lives, then we say, listen, I've never done anything that bad to anyone, or I've never done anything that bad to you. So I reserve the right to withhold forgiveness from you because I've never done anything that bad to you. But brothers and sisters, the grounds for your forgiveness does not rest in what kind of sin you've committed against each other. The grounds for your forgiveness lie in the fact that we stand sinful before God and are deserving of God's wrath, and yet he loved us with an unfathomable love. And through an unthinkable mercy, he has extended mercy to you and I. That is the grounds of your forgiveness. So Jesus, when telling this parable, says that the king calls the servant wicked. Those are some strong terms. See, when it comes to forgiveness, we often make the mistake of believing that we reserve the right to withhold it as much as we desire for as long as we desire. But this parable tells us that it is not the case. Jesus calls this man wicked for withholding forgiveness. So in the Jewish tradition that we talked about earlier, it, speak, it speaks about accepting forgiveness, right? It says if a person comes to you three times asking you for forgiveness, and there is genuine repentance, guys, okay, not the phony stuff. 
but they are genuinely repenting, trying to make things right, and you continue to reject, and you continue to reject, and you continue to reject. And this is what it says. The offender now becomes the offended. What do I mean by that? It means that the repentant offender is now considered clear because they've asked for forgiveness three times, and now the one who refuses to forgive bears the weight of that sin. So we see a similar thing happening in this text, guys. The servant that the king forgave is now considered wicked. Why? Because he's, he has become unreasonable in not extending that forgiveness to another. Do you see that? Notice not only is he withholding forgiveness, but he's actually violent in his withholding of unforgiveness or forgiveness. He chokes the man and says, pay me what you owe. You see that oftentimes, don't you? There's an arrogance in our unforgiveness. There's a boldness. There's a brazenness in our unforgiveness. Even when we've been forgiven so much, the king says, you are a wicked servant because you have lost sight of how much you've been forgiven. Verse 34, and in, and in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. The king moves from merciful to wrathful because of the servant's actions in withholding mercy from his fellow servant. The servant has, in essence, rejected the king's mercy. You can't reasonably expect to have a debt that you owe that extends through generations and generations and generations, forgive it, and then walk out and have the audacity to punish a man who can pay a debt back within 100 days. So that brews the king's anger. And then lastly, the Bible says that he's thrown in jail until he can pay back the debt. Verse 35 so also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Jesus' answer to Peter's question, how many times should we forgive? We are to forgive as much as genuinely and honestly possible, as much as they seek it. Because this is what the king has done for you and this is what the king is doing for you right now. And if you refuse to do so, know that you are rejecting the Father's mercy. Remember the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6? It says, For if you forgive others their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespass, trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Jesus says, if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What is Jesus saying there? How can he be so harsh? He's saying, if you don't have forgiveness, you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand it if you don't have forgiveness. The gospel is rooted in forgiveness. Practically speaking, when you think about forgiveness, be mindful that when you forgive, you just don't say, hey, yeah, it's over. Okay, I forgive you. When you think about forgiveness, you need to think about it in a Christian and a biblical way. You say, I will not dwell on this incident. This is what Ken Sandy wrote in Peacemakers. This is a wonderful book about conflict resolution, Christian conflict re resolution, by the way. He talks about forgiveness in four steps, right? He says, step one. I will not dwell on this incident. Step two, I will not bring this incident up and use it against you again. Step three, I will not talk to others about this incident. And step four, I will not allow this incident to stand between us or hinder our personal relationship. When someone brings genuine repentance to you, you offer genuine forgiveness in that way. I will not hold it against you. I will not dwell on it. I will not bring it up. I will not go and run and tell everybody else about it. And I will not allow it to stand in the way of our fellowship. This is what God has called us to. Okay. 
Last thing. Last thing. What if forgiveness is really, really, really hard? There are some things, guys. There are some things. I know that some of us in the room, probably all of us in the room, have experience that make forgiveness really, really, really hard. It's hard to forgive and forget. Well, the truth about it is, not much changes from what I just preached. You still need to continue to look back at the debt that has been paid by Jesus on the cross through the gospel. But let me offer one more pastoral word on this that I hope that will encourage you when forgiveness is really, really hard. Fix your eyes on the king and on the goodness of the king. See, oftentimes we hold our unforgiveness because that is the only justice we believe that will come to those who have offended us. So we think, hey, you know, this wound, this wound, it is very deep. It's very deep. So we think that, you know, this wound is so deep and nobody's getting punished for this wound. So I'm just going to hold on to unforgiveness because that's, way, that's my way of getting justice for this sin, this transgression that has been, um, been against me, done against me. But part of the journey of forgiveness is a journey of faith. It's not a simply, simply a journey of the will. It's not a simply a journey out of fear. Oh, Lord, I'm going to forgive this person because I'm afraid that you're going to come and you're going to judge me. No, it's actually a journey of trust. Do you trust the king that he is good, and then when it's all said and done, he will establish righteousness and he will establish justice? And at the end, he will right all wrongs. Do you believe the king in Romans chapter 8 when he says all things, not some, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose? Do you believe the king that he will make all things right? Because when you forgive, what you're doing and what you're saying is that even though this wound, it is deep and this scar is painful, I believe that when it's all said and done, justice will be served in ways that I don't even understand. I don't know if justice is going to occur in my lifetime. I don't know if it's going to occur in their lifetime. And I don't know if justice was already won on the back of my Savior on the cross at Calvary. But I know that you're going to make this thing right, Lord. And because you're going to make this thing right, Lord, I am going to let this thing go. Joseph, in the book of Genesis, he had a deep wound. Joseph in the Old Testament, he was sold into slavery, guys, by his own brothers. Sold into slavery by his own brothers. Could you imagine that? He worked in spite of that, and then he was accused of sexual assault by his principal officer's wife. Now, we could blame Potiphar's wife, but we can also blame the brothers because he would never have been there if it had not been for the brothers, right? So he was accused of sexual assault because of his brothers, and he was in jail because of his brothers. But then God moves him through that experience all the way to second in command in Egypt. And when he finally meets his brothers, instead of saying, I will never forgive y'all for what y'all did to me, he says, what you meant for evil God meant for good. And he released his brothers. And he extended love and grace and mercy to his brothers. Why? Was it because his brothers were good? No, it wasn't because his brothers were good. It's because he knew that the king was good. He trusted the king. So when it's hard to forgive, saints, remember your debt. But when it gets even harder, remember your king. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, life is hard. This world is filled with evil. Lord, we yearn for the day in which you will establish righteousness. But Lord, as long as we're on this side, please help us, Lord, 
to fix our eyes upon you. Lord, you have loved us with a love that we cannot even comprehend and understand. And Lord, when forgiveness is hard, help us, Lord, to fix our eyes upon you. Lord, you forgave us a debt that we could never pay. We love you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we ask all these things. Amen.